So tonight's lecture is The World That Created the Highway Men, and we have Robert Casanello here. Is he anybody's professor right now? Or must it be from? Oh, okay. <laughs> they get enough of me during the week. Oh, do they? Okay. They <laughs> um, I do want to go ahead and um, thank uh, Trent Tomango, who coordinated this talk. He's one of our board members. Um, he also, I don't know if, if you shared this with your class or not, but um, Trent also had a studio. He's a fine artist. He had a studio on site as well as part of our Artists in Action program, which is the modern version of the residency program that Andre Smith created during the historical era. And his artwork's absolutely stunning too if you haven't had a chance to look at it. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker, um, Robert Castanello. Um, he's a professor of history at the University of Central Florida. Um, he is a social historian interested in public history. You're quite accomplished. His book, To Render Invisible, Jim Crow and Public Life in New South Jacksonville, won the 2014 Harry Moore Award by the Florida Historical Society. He's also produced numerous media projects, such as the films The Committee, Filthy Dreamers, Marching Forward with Dr. Lisa Mills, um, and these films have been screened at, screened at numerous state, national, and international film festivals and won several awards, including a Suncoast Emmy and College TV Emmy. Wow. He's also produced the podcast Riches of Central Florida, a history of Central Florida podcast, Florida Historical Quarterly podcast, and the Florida Constitutions podcast. Um, he's won the Dunn Internet Broadcasting Award with the Florida Historical Society and was featured as a voice on the weekly public radio program, Florida Frontiers, uh, between 2013 and 2016. And somehow he still had time to make it out here this evening to talk to all of you. So please give him a round of applause. Thank you all uh, for having me. I will, I will do my best to get us out of here by 10 o'clock tonight, if that's okay with everybody. Okay. That's how my students sound. Oh, I'm used to it. Um, okay, uh, I feel like I have to preface this talk with a few disclaimers. One, uh, maybe most important, is uh, I'm not an art historian. So I'm not approaching this talk um, from the vantage point of art history. Um, I'm just going to completely askew that. Um, and luckily enough, when um, I was contacted to do this talk, I was told specifically that they wanted someone to talk about history, not art history. So um, this is what uh, we're all signed up for. The second thing is I'm not anywhere near an expert on the highwaymen. Uh, so specific details about them and their work and things like this is, is not really in my wheelhouse, per se. I, may, I know a lot of stuff about them, more than um, the average person, but not enough to call myself an expert uh, by any stretch of the imagination. So. I may say something up here in reference to the highwaymen that may not be historically accurate, and feel free to call me out on that because, again, I don't claim to be an expert on the highwaymen. So if there's something you notice and say, wait, that's been proven wrong or whatever, let's have it. I don't have an ego. You're not going to hurt my feelings. Um, and if I cry, I promise I won't cry until I get to my car. <laughs> on the way home, I'll just stop All right. So, uh, I was sort of charged with, again, coming up with a history talk as opposed to an art history talk. And I was asked to see the exhibit, and based on what I saw in the exhibit, what kind of history could I pull together? And that's basically what I did. And so going through the exhibit on the day that I came here, um, there were some themes in the exhibit that really sort of spoke out to me. And the thing that sort of tied all those different themes together was this idea that the high, we have to think of the highwayman as a moment, right? That there were certain factors, certain things that had happened, um, you know, forces that were put in place, if you will, that allowed the highwaymen to kind of emerge and blossom at a certain point in time in a certain place. That without those factors, without those things, maybe the highwaymen would not have um, existed, let's say. And so that's kind of what I'm contemplating with this, with this talk, if you will. Um, and one thing I do want to mention is it's not just highwaymen, but highwaymen and women. There were women artists who were highwaymen. I don't want to give them short shrift. Although um, I'm not actually going to talk about the highwaymen per se. I will speak about one uh, specific artist, and I'll talk a little bit about why I'm doing that. 
but it's not really so much about the artists um, as much as about maybe uh, the, the broad artistic movement, if you will. So that's all my all my disclaimers. No one's rushing out the door, so I guess you're okay. You're like, okay, I'm, I'm here. All right. Let me... Okay, the first, again, I'm not going to talk about specific um, how I met except for Harold Newton. And what I want you to kind of uh, notice is where he was born. He was born in Tifton, Georgia. That's going to come become important a little bit later in the talk. I just wanted to kind of note that. And the reason um, I'm introducing you to Harold Newton and only Harold Newton is because I, in doing some research for this talk, I found a newspaper article from the Miami Herald. I'll go back and show you the, it's from the Miami Herald, February 15th, 1959. Um, and I was trying to, I did a newspaper search for um, topics that would bring up any of these artists from the contemporary news of their time. Not later when people were like doing retrospectives of them, but during the time that they were doing this art. And I only found this one. And it might be because I'm an incompetent historian. I'm not taking that off the table. But I did find this one article, it's only this one article on um, Harold Newton. And again, this is from the Miami Herald. And you can see there's not two nice photos of him from, um, from this piece. And the um, reporter sort of did a little um, profile of him. Um, and of course, uh, the words highwayman's never used in this. It's just a look at this landscape artist, okay? Um, and that's sort of the crux of the profile. Now, uh, what I want us to take away from here, and this is partly because I'm a historian, so I look at this within its historical context, um, is we can't really treat this profile as um, at face value, let's say. Because um, what is embedded in this profile, I'm assuming the reporter was white, I actually didn't research that to know for sure, but I'm assuming the reporter was white just based on how it was written and the tone in which it was written. It's, it's, it's connotated in the racism of the time, even though the reporter, and I'm sure the reporter at the time felt this way, was writing a very positive piece of Newton um, as a person and an artist, but it you know, the, the white reporter couldn't, you know, do so without um, enconcing himself within the, um, within the racism of the time. So what I did is I pulled out some pieces from here that is going to emphasize some of the themes I want to talk about uh, after, which is sort of the, um, you know, the ways in which this time and place in Florida was the perfect environment for the highwaymen to emerge. Um, and I have some of the passages, too, that also denote some of the more um, um, racist context um, that the reporter was operating in. So again, this is coming right from the article. And you can see here, the simple formula for living belongs to the 25-year-old Fort Pierce uh, Negro artist named Harold Newton, who believes in the direct approach. If you want something like three meals or a house or a baby or a car paid for, he simply goes to the nearest scenery, transfers it to canvas, frames it, and pedals it door to door until it's sold. So this is kind of a description of who he is as an artist. And again, this runs really contrary to how we know the highwaymen, right? Like this doesn't really kind of match the way we understand them today at all. And again, you gotta understand this is 1959. This is a white reporter in one of the largest uh, newspapers in the state of Florida. And so what I want you to kind of think about in this, in this passage here, of course, um, you know, is the idea that he has a simple formula for living, right? And so the reporter seeing Newton as like, okay, here's a person that just kind of gets by day to day, you know, and again, this is part of that, that, that racist context I was, um, I was pointing to uh, earlier. Um, and you can see the direct approach as well. So I think the direct approach, use of that phrase is sort of connotating that, you know, Newton's not a person who's uh, quote unquote cultured, if you will, right? And we do know he was educated. He, was, he wasn't someone who uh, 
you know, I believe he did attend college at least. I'm, I don't remember um, if, he, if he finished college or not, but I, I believe he did attend college. Um, and then you can see it's kind of like it's depicting Newton as well. He's just kind of, you know, um, hustling, right? He's just taking his paintings, going door to door. Hey, you want a painting? I need a sandwich. You want a painting? I need some gas for my car or something. That kind of makes him seem like, oh, here's a, you know, here's an African American man with a, with a successful hustle here, and so that's sort of the context of, um, of this passage here in this article. And again, this runs counter to how we understand uh, how we men today. And again, I don't want to give you the sense that this newspaper article represents accuracy or should be treated as accuracy, but I kind of want to give you a sense of the world because this gives us a. a a window into the world that Newton and others operated in, right? So when they were doing these paintings, when they had them, when they were presenting them to potential buyers, this is what white folks saw, right? Okay, here's another piece uh, from this. Uh, a Fort Pierce car dealer acquired a Newton <clears throat> for a down payment. And Harold is probably the only living person who has conned so you see the word there, con, right? Con the General Finance Corporation into accepting a work of art in lieu of a car payment. That car, incidentally, is Newton's traveling office, and it is notable. He's painted it to look as if it's in flames. This creates quite a lot of attention from prospective customers. And come Christmas, Newton's paintings turn by magic into clothes and toys for the children. So again, it's kind of emphasizing this idea of um, you know, African Americans kind of hustling, um, hustling to, um, to kind of get by here. And of course, you should note too the description of the car being in flames, ostentatious, kind of not fitting in to sort of you know, proper quote unquote business society, if you will, again. So you can see this, this piece is really kind of um, trippy with, with uh, a, a real kind of paternal um, and condescending, if you, will. you know, cond condescending description of Newton. <clears throat> Excuse me, has not only an artist, but also um, a businessman. Okay. He has knocked successfully on some pretty impressive doors in the course of his career. His works are hanging in the Florida Bank at Florida Pierce, or Fort Pierce, in the sales room of Port St. Lucie Mackle Development and the Seahorse Inn in neighboring Vero Beach and are a regularly selling feature at the Art Mart in fashionable Palm Beach and in many fine homes and offices in the area. He's solvent, happy, ulcer-free, independent, and if success is any criteria, a good artist, right? So again, it's, it's these same themes I'm, I'm pointing to is in this piece as well. And I kind of also want you to be thinking about the business and economic networks um, Newton is creating. You know, um, you know, you have to kind of read this article against the grain, if you will, you know, kind of kind of get things out of it that isn't the intent of the report, but that we're seeing, you know, uh, decades later. And of course, um, you know, this matches our understanding of the highwaymen in that they were these kind of economic um, entrepreneurs who went around businesses and you know things like this. <clears throat> okay, now a father of four, including a pair of twins, Harold Newton has retired from the labor field and has the open sesame to successful living. Um, and this is kind of a really interesting turn of phrase and a theme I want to come back to, but this idea that um, you know he was no longer going to be a, a manual laborer, if you will. Right now, he was going to be self-employed with these paintings. And of course, if you saw the exhibit in there, you'll notice that uh, most of these artists—I don't think all of them—but most of these artists started out as agricultural laborers in and around Lake Okeechobee, and just south of there. Um, a lot of that is migratory labor. A lot of that is seasonal labor. And so this is kind of the labor that the reporter is noting he's now turning away from for this kind of entrepreneurial pursuit. But again, if you read the entire article, you know, like the, the reporter never um, acknowledges that money changes hands, right? 
it's it's because you'll see in the, in the next sentence that I'm, I'm not really focusing on, you see the word barter there. So the entire article is about Newton just bartering um, paintings for services, right, or or products. Okay, and again, this is part of the of the white condescension is this idea that oh, this person doesn't realize they should probably be turning this into currency, right? And so that's where the kind of like the entire emphasis here is based on the idea that these African Americans are bartering these works of art, not um, creating commerce, hard currency commerce through them. And of course, we know now that that's not true. But again, this is the reporter kind of fitting Newton into his expectations of what it was to be a black man in Florida in 1959. Okay. And then you can see he's got a studio and studios in quotes, right? In an empty jewelry store in Fort Pierce's Lincoln, Lincoln Park. And you see rent barter, right? And lives in a trailer, rent barter. Among congenial neighbors, his work is, his work is play. So again, it feeds into the stereotypical images of African Americans as kind of happy-go-lucky. This is like, you know, this isn't work, He's, it's fun. It's, you know, it, it's appealing to a more base kind of emotion or instinct for African Americans, at least that's what uh, the white reporter in 1959 probably believed. He does it when he feels like it or when he wants something. And again, it's very impulsive here. It's the idea that Newton's this impulsive person. Of course, of course he's not, you know, trying to you know, generate hard currency, he's impulsive. And he just takes the painting, and he gives the painting, and he gets a sandwich, or he gives the painting, and he pays the rent on his, um, on his home, or the, um, his car payment, or something like that. Uh, it's, it's almost like the reporter's just kind of amazed at what um, it is that he has seen. His talent is appreciated, and of course, he's a happy man. Um, okay, so what we have here, Again, as problematic as this article is in the ways that, that I've kind of described to you, but you have a kind of a lot of the, I think, the telltales of how and why the highwaymen become this artistic movement, if you will, right, during that time and place. And this is what I kind of want to focus on in, in, in the rest of the talk here. Okay, so what I want to go first. Before we, uh, before we get to the highwaymen, because I really do believe, and um, I will say this because I'm, I don't know if I'm the only historian, but I might be one of the few historians who will tell you that there is nothing ever unique in history. There is no such thing as exceptional anything, right? But I'm gonna make the case the highwaymen were an exceptional movement, that they represented something very unique, unique to Florida, unique to them, and it kind of confounds me because every fiber of my being tells me you can't believe that as a philosophy. But I'm going to do my best to, to make that case here. Um, so, so sort of bear with me. And the highwayman, and again, I'm not an art historian, so I'm basing this on conversations I've had with actual art historians and things that I've read. And again, I could be wrong. If you want to challenge me on this, I will fold really easily. I will just say I give up. You're right. Um, but... The highwayman style of art is what's known as outsider art, okay? And um, I know to me, when I first learned about this, I thought, oh, isn't outsider art kind of pejorative? Uh, no. But apparently it is not, as in my understanding, I've talked to some, um, some artists about this, and they said, oh, I don't see it that way. Uh, so I'll take it from them. Um, and outsider art is the, is the artist who is kind of self-trained, self-taught, and produces their art, right? And so what I wanna do is talk a little bit about some outsider art produced by African Americans that aren't, maybe share some similarities to what the highwaymen were doing, but weren't exactly like the highwaymen. Just to give you a sense that African Americans doing this outside art is not something, um, you're not something unique in and of themselves, and only the highwaymen were doing this, but it's you know, sort of a broader um, uh, type of movement, if you will. So one person I want to look at is uh, Bill Trailer, 
and look at the years that he lived. He was born in 1853. He was born into slavery, and he died in 1949. Okay, and um, what you'll notice in those years, quite a few years, I, I, I think, I guess, yeah, he lived um, well into his 90s. Um, but he would have seen slavery, he would have seen the Civil War, Reconstruction, Jim Crow, and probably the, the early victories of the Civil Rights Movement, at least up to the late 1940s, right? So you, you would have kind of seen, not to mention the Depression, um, World War II, and all this kind of stuff. Um, and on the right side here is some of the art that he had done, and of course this is landscape art. This is, again, self-taught outsider art. Uh, type of thing here. Um, and what I want you to notice in his sort of bio here is he's born in Pleasant Hill, Alabama. Um, I'd imagine no one in here was born in Pleasantville, Alabama, right? So I could say anything about Pleasantville, no one's going to call me on it, right? Good, good, that's important. So you can imagine Pleasantville, Alabama, again, he was born into slavery, probably more than likely on a plantation, in a rural environment, right? That's sort of what I want to establish with that, okay? But look where he dies. He dies in Montgomery, Alabama. Would anybody characterize Montgomery, Alabama, especially in 1949? Would anybody characterize Montgomery, Alabama as rural, per se? No, it's more of an urban, right? It's the capital of Alabama. It is for Alabama, not to diss Alabama too much. I want to diss Alabama, just not too much, just a little bit. But for Alabama, it's an urban city, right? You know, uh, Mobile, Mobile, Montgomery, Birmingham in the 1940s would be kind of the few urban centers in, uh, in Alabama. So this is kind of an important thing. It represents someone who is, who is producing outsider art, right? And moving themselves from a rural environment, at least to, by the end of their life, to an urban environment. So that rural to urban shift is what I want us to sort of think about here. And of course, he's, he's, you know, he dies well before any of these artists kind of get, um, they're actually, in 1949 when he dies, the highwaymen and women artists are, you know, very young. You know, not even teenagers yet. Okay, Clementine Hunter, another outside artist. Um, and look at her years, 1887 to 1987. So that's uh, 101, she was 101, right? So maybe um, do some outsider art. It might create longevity in your life, possibly. Go get some art supplies, just paint something. Um, so uh, she's, now she's different um, from trailer because um, you can notice she actually doesn't, in, if you take her birth and death, she's like within a 20 mile radius of, um, of both uh, life events. So I don't get the impression that she moved to a large city like uh, Bill Trailer did, but she did produce this kind of outsider art. She really kind of worked in uh, rural life themes, plantation life themes, that was what um, she painted mostly. And um, I'm not 100% sure about Trailer, but I know her, like the Highwaymen, um, she was selling her paintings. Now, she sold her paintings through intermediaries. She wasn't selling them herself because who's going to go to rural, out, rural Louisiana and buy paintings, right? But she was connected with someone who her paintings were sent to New York and then were, um, were purchased in studios in New York City. And that's how she was able to sell them um, and create kind of an economic livelihood, if you will. Um, so that's her connection, uh, at least to the highwaymen in that way. Okay, here's another one of her paintings. Like I said, she did these kind of uh, paintings of rural life in, um, in the South. Okay, and finally, here is someone, he would be a contemporary of the highwaymen. Maybe, you know, he's about the same age as is the highway born in, in 1943. He was a Miami artist of Herbert Young, and he, again, epitomizes um, the, um, the outside art uh, dynamic that I'm mentioning here. And I included him because he's, he's from Miami. He actually was born in Liberty City, and he, 
and he dies in Miami. So he he's born in an urban environment and dies in an urban environment. Uh, so he's a little bit different in that way, but he's also someone who, um, you'll notice here's a picture of him. He paints, he was really famous painting murals in Miami. He would paint these murals on buildings that were quite uh, stunning and um, created a great deal of conversation. But he also did these things um, that uh, sometimes he would sell. So very much like the highwayman in that way. A little bit different, it's not a landscape artist, obviously, but, um, but an outside, a, a self-taught outsider part. Okay, now I kind of want to move along and talk about that moment in time that I think created the highwayman, okay? And so what I have up here is a map, map of uh, what we refer to as the Sun Belt. I know there's, there's some uh, scholars who don't like to use the term Sun Belt. I don't personally have a problem with it. I think it applies in many ways. Um, but what happens after World War II is Florida moves into the Sun Belt economy, right? And what a Sun Belt economy is really kind of what follows the red on this map here. It's places that have um, good weather most of the year. You know, Florida, most of Florida at least has good weather throughout the entire year. And when I say good weather, I'm meaning no snow, right? That's what good weather means, right? No snow. Um, so um, what happens after World War II is um, there's what we refer to as a Sun Belt economy that emerges. And um, industries, commerce, big commerce, I mean, capital and things, begin to move into the Sun Belt from the Northeast and the Midwest, right? And so this phenomenon is what we refer to as the Sun Belt. And so what the Sun Belt brings to the South, or at least the places in the South that are impacted most by the Sun Belt, um, it are, is this transformation. And in this transformation, are sort of the elements for what makes the highwaymen movement a movement, I think. All right. So the things I want us to think about, the transformations I'm speaking about, um, is economic, demographic, and social. So I'll talk about each of these things. And in each of these instances, you know, it creates, again, the, um, the foundation for uh, the highwaymen and their success, right? And again, without this, without the Sun Belt, I don't think there would be a high, there would be a highwayman movement, or at least there wouldn't be a highwayman movement we would be aware of. Right? Okay, so what we have to think about first, I think, is um, the Great Migration. I'm sure a lot of you have heard that term before, right? The Great Migration, the movement, and I'm sure. Many of you, when you went to school, you heard, well, the Great Migration was a movement of African Americans from the South to the North, right? Does that sound familiar? It's actually wrong. If you want to call your high school history teacher now, get them on the phone and say, hey, when you told me about the Great Migration, did you know you weren't accurate? Did you know? I got this, I got this guy here telling me, you don't know what you're talking about. No. Don't do that to your high school history teacher. All right, uh, what it actually was, was a movement of African Americans from rural locations to urban locations. And we believed for a long time that this was to the north because we saw letters going to the north. We all assumed, you know, the Jim Crow South was what African Americans were running from, right? And I'm not trying to say that that's not true, but it's not the entire story, right? Um, some sociologists at the Tuskegee University in the 1930s actually compiled all this data. And what they learned was that, um, and this would be before World War II, what they had learned was that more African Americans moved from a southern rural location to a southern urban location, then moved from a southern rural location to a northern urban location. So if you look at the Great Migration, has a movement of people, there are more people moving internally in the South than are moving from the South to the North or the South to the Midwest, right? What they all have in common is they're moving to cities, right? It's not that they're moving South to North, they're moving rural to urban, right? 
And that's a really important, um, that's a really important um, shift in population because in, in 18, 1870, right? So I'm going by census years. In 1870, 1% of the African-American population was urban, 1%. That means 99%, because I know everyone's probably not good at math, right? 99% rural, right? 100 years later, a little over 100 years later, 1980, right? 1% of the African-American population, are you ready for this, is rural. 99% are urban. So in that 110 year period, African Americans in this country go from a rural environment to an urban environment, like wholesale in that 110 year, 10 year period, for a variety of reasons. Um, again, some of it is Jim Crow, some of it is racism, lynching, and all the stuff that we believe about the Great Migration, but other things are economic. Right? At some point, you know, there's a sharecropping system. At some point in the life of a black sharecropper, they realize that they will be in debt for life. And being in debt for life to them sounds very much like slavery. Right? And so at some point they leave and they go to an urban environment where they could sell their labor, where they could accumulate wealth over a lifetime. Right? And sort of that's a really important factor in the shift I just mentioned over that 110 year period. And so what I have up here is the first great migration and what some people call the second great migration. And um, you can see again, it's the cities that are you know, gaining in, these, in this migration. Um, in the second great migration, you'll notice there's a great westward shift in, in that. But you'll notice, look at Florida, in the great migration and the second great migration, you know. Urban centers, look, you see Jacksonville's represented, Tampa, Miami, in both of those charts, in the first great migration, the second migration. So you can see in Pensacola's there too. Pensacola's the smaller, the smaller dot. Um, so you, you can see in these charts here that, um, you know, Florida, Florida urban centers are receiving places for African Americans, rural African Americans caught up in this great migration. Now, to add to that, here is a chart of just a 10-year window of sunbelt migration. So sunbelt migration would include African Americans, but also include um, whites and other ethnic groups as well. And you'll notice that, again, look at Florida. Florida is gaining anywhere from 30 to 50 percent in that 10 years, right? So in that Sunbelt migration, there are people moving, moving into Florida in, in large numbers, right? Okay, so what this means, what this means in the context of the world that created the highwaymen is that um, this population growth, this demographic growth that was happening throughout the 20th century probably reaching um, not necessarily an apex, but uh, an acceleration by 1950 in Florida, right? Creates the market for the highwaymen, right? Because remember, I showed you some of the other artists earlier, right? What if the highwaymen were in, you know, um, rural Louisiana, you know? They might be able to produce those landscapes, but are folks gonna remember them? Are folks going to remember them, you know, as sort of a, a great movement, if you will? Probably not. They might remember a landscape artist here or there, but not sort of the, you know, sort of the the, the gulf of the uh, the entire highwayman. So this from farm to city movement is really important um, for the uh, for the world that the highwayman created. And again, if you go into the exhibit, you'll notice that a lot of those highwaymen artists started on farms. They were young people. Their parents were farm workers. They became farm workers, and then eventually they left. They became self-employed, right? 
And how and why do they get self-employed? Well, they moved to an urban center. Remember, some of the photos you saw in the exhibit, you know, they were in rural Lake Okeechobee, right? On a lot of that farmland in Lake Okeechobee, right? Um, but then they go to Fort Pierce. You know, they sort of follow the highway, if you will. And um, the people who are starting to populate those places. Okay, so here I got a sort of map, and this is, this of course is US-1, but don't think of just US-1, but there's, you know, US-1, there's the Turnpike, there's I-95 that goes through this uh, kind of southern corridor, um, if you will. And again, this is also really important for the world that created the highwaymen, because in order to get from place to place, location to location, they needed roads and they needed cars. Remember the article I had mentioned about Newton? Um, you know, mentioned his car, right? He got a car. He's, he, he, according to the article, bartered a uh, painting for a car. I find that a bit dubious, but I don't have any way to challenge it. Um, but the car was essential, right? Mobility was essential, right? And those cars are important in the economy, in the businesses that emerge uh, through these individual artists. Right? Hop in the car, put your paintings in the trunk, go from place to place, business to business. The roads are important for doing that. The cars are important for doing that. You know, and it, if you'll notice, there's sort of this, this theme of movement here, right? Uh, if you think about it. Um, you know, with the Great Migration, uh, African Americans are moving, right? Their, their life themes important to them are about movement. And the car and the highways are an important part of that theme of movement, that being able to be mobile, being able to go from one place to another. Okay, and this is um, it's downtown, oh, I can't remember, um, it's in, it's in um, St. Lucie County. I'm just drawing a blank on the community, but it's, um, it'll come back to me like 12 o'clock tonight. Stewart? Not Stewart. Uh, what's that? Not Port St. Lucie. What's the other city in? It's the other one. Not Fort Pierce. Maybe another one. Um, it's actually Indian River, I think. Vero, 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 yes, Vero, thank you. Vero. It is Vero, right. Thank you, see? Okay. So this is downtown Vero, uh, 1970, I believe, 70-ish, I don't have a date for this, but I believe this is a postcard, you know, that was sort of advertising, hey, you want to come to Vero, this is what it looks like, right? Um, and I wanted to kind of show you this, because imagine, you know, the highwaymen going to Vero and going shop to shop to sell those paintings, right? And again, the Sun Belt creates this urban environment, creates this urban landscape. And this urban landscape is the market for the highwaymen, right? To be able to kind of um, sell, create the commerce by which um, they became known, right? Now, the civil rights movement. Um, the Civil Rights Movement has a very close association with the Sun Belt. Because remember, the Sun Belt, probably the, the, the most central thing about the Sun Belt is economy, right? The economy. And there's some places who thrive in the Sun Belt, and there's some places uh, that look like the Rust Belt in the South, right? Uh, so, for example, you know, if you're in parts of rural Alabama, rural Louisiana, uh, rural East Texas, Georgia, these places, uh, it looks like a Rust Belt economy. It doesn't look like a Sun Belt economy. But if you're in like Atlanta, New Orleans, um, you know, Dallas, Jacksonville, Miami, it looks like the Sun Belt. It looks like the Vero photo I showed you. So what you have to kind of ask yourself, um, what are the 
sort of give and take for those opportunities, right? And um, a place like Florida and the politicians in Florida in the 19, late 1950s, 1960s, into the 1970s were very keenly aware that if Florida and parts of Florida looked like Birmingham, Alabama, people are not going to bring their businesses here, right? Banks are not going to open shop. Um, you know, the big corporations aren't going to come to Sunbelt, Florida if Florida looked like Birmingham, Alabama with the hoses and the dogs and beating civil rights workers and things like this. Or Mississippi. Right? And uh, the governor at the time in the, in the late 50s um, was keenly aware of this. And actually what he did is he created what were referred to, what was referred to, uh, it was a, a government, it was a governmental agency, uh, I believe it was called the Florida Civil Rights Commission. And so local communities in Florida were invited to create local civil rights commissions for their communities. And the places that had civil rights commissions in Florida were urban and suburban places. Okeechobee didn't have a, a, a civil rights commission. You know, rural, you know, Stark, Florida didn't have a civil rights commission, but Jacksonville did, Orlando did, Miami did, Fort Lauderdale did, Tampa did. Um, I think the only city that I, I believe didn't have one was St. Augustine. That was the only urban city they passed on the opportunity to create a civil rights commission. But all, all the other major urban centers suburban um, communities created these civil rights um, and this would have started 1958 I believe went through about 63 64 and the purpose of, of these commissions were to bring white leaders and black leaders locally together around the table and say how do we not be Birmingham and you know there's a lot of argument about how successful they were whether it was window dressing all this other stuff and we can kind of debate that stuff but the fact that it existed sent a message to outside economic interests and say, look, Florida is not Mississippi. Florida is not Alabama. And it was that Sunbelt, um, the perceived Sunbelt tolerance, if you will, I'm trying to be careful with my language here, is was really important for that money to flow. Again, if the highwaymen were in you know, Meridian, Mississippi, Maybe they don't have the economic um, wherewithal to, to be able to, um, to develop in the way they could in Florida. And so, um, again, I'm not trying to say there was racial harmony in Florida because of the Sun Belt. I'm not saying that at all. But the state was well aware that in order to bring economic interests in Florida, it had to give the appearance that Florida was a racially harmonious place. So this is actual pictures of protests and violence in Florida for the civil rights movement. But again, the state of Florida was trying to counter this in, in very important ways. And I think to some extent they were successful in that reimagining of Florida as a tolerant place. Um, because we saw, we see the impact of the Sun Belt. It didn't drive people um, away from setting up shop here for, for banks and capital to come into Florida during this time. Okay, another important aspect of the civil rights movement is it created the space for African Americans and whites to sort of come together and at least communicate. And so I mentioned the Florida Civil Rights Commissions that were throughout the uh, urban parts of the state, and again, those were made up of, of local black leaders, local white leaders. They all met in the same room um, regularly. They uh, agreed to do things together cooperatively. So that's a kind of space, a racial space, interracial space that's created um, with that commission. And I think uh, to some extent, uh, A.E. Backus plays that role for the highwayman, right? He opens up his, um, you know, his studio to them teaches him some things, and actually, he's actually mentioned in the, um, that Miami Herald piece. They mention him, and they mention um, him showing some tricks of the trade to Newton. 
Um, so he's actually actually sort of in the piece. It doesn't kind of contextualize it as you know white and black harmony or anything like that. You don't really know that. The only reason you know that A. E. Bacchus is white is because his race is never mentioned. Only Newton's race is mentioned. So that's why you know he's. That's why the reporter. That's how the report is communicating to the readers that he's white. But the reporter didn't make a big deal of this at all. But it does kind of, you know, you have to wonder, well, if this was a different time, if this was earlier, this was the Depression, would that space exist in Florida for, um, you know, um, for Bacchus and some of these highwaymen to, um, to exist? And um, if, again, if they were in a rural part, would that space exist? Remember, they're in Fort Pierce. Bacchus is in Fort Pierce as well. And so Fort Pierce is part of this urbanizing, um, urbanizing trend in Sunbelt, Florida. Okay, and finally, I told you I told you I wasn't going to do any any art, um, arty stuff here, and I lied. Now I'm going to do some arty stuff. Um, and I and I, I don't. I'll preface this with I have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about. So I'm going to just give you an opinion, and my opinion is probably valueless, but I will give it to you anyway. So one of the things I think is sort of interesting, I think it's Sunbelt related, which is why I want to kind of bring this up, because what the Sunbelt does, not only does it have these economic changes, social changes, right, um, political changes, demographic changes, but also has environmental changes, right? You know, um, if we were to come down the coast of Florida where Fort Pierce is all the way down to Miami in 1890, Right? We wouldn't see cities, we would see mangroves, right? Mangroves like this. This is what the environment looked like. And then in the 1920s, all that got paved, right? It all got paved um, and then got sold um, since 1920, uh, many times over. But of course, this is where people are flocking to during the Sun Belt, is the, the southeast urban coast, right? And what I always find kind of interesting is you know the this is sort of what the um, highwaymen would have been accustomed to at the time that they were operating. You know maybe they had some uh, experience with um, uh, you know native lands, if you will, mangroves and the Everglades and things um, when they were in a rural environment. But I think by the time that they were you know. Um, actively pursuing their businesses, I think this is what they would have been kind of accustomed to and would have been looking at um, day to day. And I think on some level, these, um, yeah? So I'm familiar with Fort Pierce and Bureau uh -huh. growing up in that area. A mile out of town, you were in rural. Oh, so you'd see these kind of environments? Yes, you would see a lot of these along A1A or US-1. Okay. You'd see a lot of these sunrises and sunsets. So, okay. uh, what you're interpreting is an urban area. Don't relate it to a Miami area because it was a small, oh, yeah. rural, that's a good point. Yeah. area. Yeah. Indian River Grove. Sure. All of this was orange groves out there. Sure, sure. So, yeah, I don't know what I'm talking about. So what <laughs> I proved it. All right. Um, that's a very good point. I, I appreciate you bringing up. Um, I, I, I don't know if you know, but to me, there's like these different kind of styles of the landscape, right? So some of it, I think, is literal, if you will. Like you look at it, and you're like, okay, I, I could see that in my head, right? But some of it is fictive, right? Like this is, to me, it's fictive, right? Because it's the colors are really kind of bright, things like this, right? And um, what I'm imagining, and again, I might be wrong, what I'm imagining is maybe these artists were painting a, a landscape that was being lost, right? Lost to development, lost to roads and cities and things like that. And again, I could be wrong. I don't, you know, I've never asked any highwaymen about this. But to me, that's what kind of it, it evokes in me because I come at this through the Sun Belt, through, through the Sun Belt um, interpretation, right? Okay, and finally, uh, so again, what I'm trying to demonstrate in this in this talk here is that the highwaymen are unique to Florida. And again, um, I research Florida history. I write Florida history. I 
teach Florida history, and I disabuse the notion of the Florida man. I go, there's no such thing as the Florida man. There's nothing unique in Florida. Everything that happens in Florida happens in other places. And I finally found an exception to that rule in the highwayman. I don't think the highwayman can or would have existed anywhere else. And it took all of these things that I mentioned to you, that I pointed out to you, for the highwayman as we understand them to emerge. And so this would be the kind of exception to the rule um, that I sort of live by as a, as a historian to say that, well, the highwaymen are this kind of unique, exceptional thing because you just, you don't find them in any other place. And I tried doing a newspaper database search in the 50s and 60s to see if there was any kind of traveling, black art movement or anything, you know, and I, I couldn't find anything. Only in, you know, I mean, you can't really find it in Florida either, except I hit on this uh, Newton article. Um, but I didn't see anything anywhere else comparable to what we see. All right. Thank you. I hope I at least was entertaining. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and you know, I think a lot of people have trouble with the highwaymen, like exactly what you're saying, putting them in context, because, you know, I don't know, I'm speaking for myself here, but, you know, whenever whenever art comes into it, because I'm such a ignorant person of art, I just turn off immediately, so I don't even have to deal with that. So, no, I don't have the, I don't have the means to process it. And it wasn't, but for the, this exercise for me to do that, right, to say, okay, I got to come up with something to understand this, and this is what I came up with, was my creating context out of the highwaymen uh, as best that I could. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's very important. Job one, I think, for a historian, in my opinion. For those that are gonna stay and go to the gallery, there's actually an interview with Dorothea Hare, Alfred Hare's uh, widow. And she talks about a lot of this movement, but I think Alfred really looked at this as a, a way because he taught other highwaymen how to paint. And it was a way out of the field. It was a way mm -hmm. to earn a living and, and make it a decent living. Right. And they had salesmen driving those paintings as well, not just themselves. Yeah. I actually interviewed, um, what is his name? Al? He was one of the younger ones. He's still alive in Fort Pierce. I can't remember his last name. Al something? Black. Al Black, yeah. I interviewed Al Black. Years ago, I was working with a student on a project, and he said, um, oh, I know this highwayman, and I called him on the phone, he said we could drive down to Fort Pierce and interview him uh, for an old history. And I go, oh, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> we just got in a car and we drove down there. And really nice guy. Uh, he let us in his house, and uh, you know, we interviewed him and stuff. And I, he's in there, he's in the exhibit, you'll see some stuff about him. And he started out selling the paintings and then started painting himself. But if I understand it correctly, I'd have to go back over the interview. I don't think he. I don't think he. He believes he was a highwayman. He thinks he was something else. He wasn't trying to do what the rest of them were doing. He was doing it. He believes he was doing a different thing. And I'm not criticizing that. I'm just telling you what how he describes himself. Um, and obviously now he does very different things than uh, than the landscape stuff. Uh, but he was he was really interesting. Um, you know, just has an individual has a personality and everything. Um, but you know a lot of the stuff, you know, it's, it's almost like a lot of these artists who who lived long enough to get the acclaim, they kind of um, gravitate towards kind of common narratives of the highwaymen. So it's hard to get kind of new stuff out of them because it's, you know they, they sort of say tell the old, old stories and the old stories have been consumed so much that you know it's it's almost like it's oversynthesized. Well, yeah. What they were selling then. And cost of what they were selling them mm -hmm. was very low. Now, you know, growing up in South Florida and being partially aware of this and not necessarily my type of art at that time of my life, I, you know, I looked down my nose at it. Now, 
<laughs> you're not the only one I talked to. It's not, it's way too expensive. Even the second and third generation yeah. painters who are doing the same thing, thank God they're getting the money for their work that they deserve. Yeah, yeah. But it's like I was told a lot of these paintings that were painted, and they were talking about Alfred Hare's production line more or less. Mm -hmm. These paintings went out. I mean, they were sold on the side yeah. of the road, and these were wet when they went out the door. Sure. They painted on gypsum board. Yeah. And so it wasn't a canvas. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Was, you know, yeah. That you know that was the big thing. Um, Al Black mentioned like when he moved to canvas. You know that was like the thing that he. Canvas had, was expensive. Yeah. They could do it on gypsum board because it was less expensive. Yeah, because I think that's like I think that was. I'm doing this from memory, but I think that was Al Black's point. It was kind of like I'm not like the highwayman. Because I also paint on canvas, thus I'm a real artist. I'm a real, real artist. Art. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was his, his point that I recall. Trent? You have a lot of people here probably don't know what oxen board is. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a wood, right? Well, it's, it's a, a form of drywall. It's like a yeah. commercial yeah. Right? Okay. It's before drywall, which is gypsum. Okay. Yeah. And, and the idea was to have the most economical way of making these paintings. Because they were selling them for twenty-five, sure. thirty dollars a piece. So if you sell five paintings in a day, that's one hundred twenty-five dollars. Right. It's a lot of money for these guys in the nineteen seventies. Were they doing like twenty or thirty a day? Yeah, they were yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, right. right. cranking right. out like twenty or thirty a day. It was so a single line of Alfred there. And it's, so, you know, it's interesting too, because again, like I, I try to talk to a few art historians I know to kind of give me a sense of, of how I should approach some of this stuff. And um, and so, like your comment, you know, came to mind because a few of them, not all of them, but a few of them were kind of like landscape landscape paintings inherently is not art. <laughs> I mean, you know, like they dismiss the entire you know genre, I guess, if you will, right? Of landscape. So it's like, you know, why are we even talking about? Why are we calling landscape art? What's that? I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to call them out because they operate locally, and I don't, I don't want to put anybody. These were private conversations. I don't want to put it kind of out there. But that was that was what they kind of impressed upon me. The other thing, and I'm not sure this is. This was just something told to me, so don't quote me on this. But there was also there's also a feeling by some of these folks that um, you know obviously you know what. What Trent just mentioned, as far as um, the number of paintings produced per day, right? There's got to be hundreds of thousands of paintings out there, right? And uh, one person I talked to is convinced that it's sort of like diamonds. Like there are these, there are these paintings in warehouses, and they keep a tap on the market, so that you know if uh, if the price of a, of a highwayman painting gets too low, it gets shut down. And then the price goes back up. It's like almost like a cartel kind of thing. Again, I don't know that this is true. This could be tinfoil hat kind of stuff. I don't know. Confirm, but you know, uh, in the planning of the exhibition here, uh -huh. um, there's so many things that I think that you hit on that are incredibly correct, and I'd like to talk about it for a while. But I will make a couple of statements that, um, first of all, to your point you just made, we had um, we were pleased to get our collection in this exhibition from the Orange County Regional History Center. And we thought that because um, there's been so much highwayman activity lately over the last couple of years, that these works might have been shown before. And they said, no, no, these, these hadn't been loaned out at all. And then I started researching the show at Alma and stuff like that that happened a couple of years ago. And there were certain collectors that had lent their exhibition to the, to the to show at Alma that had a several hundred of the highwaymen. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly what you were saying. They had kind of accumulated this mass group of them and then what they would do is they led them to exhibitions like OMA because that if they're in if the Highwayman is in, in an exhibition it gets kind of accredited, you know what I mean? As and then the value goes up. So it is it's a complete like it is this kind of It is a cartel which it's like a money laundering <laughs> thing. I don't want to say it but I have to say it, you know? No sure. one point you, you brought up and it is something and credit to my director, uh, when we started this conversation about how we want to structure this exhibition we knew, um, you know, as a curator here, I knew that this wasn't my story to tell. And uh, 
as we started to do the research, we started coming across all these kind of racist tropes about the group that you had brought up, like in the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, like this framing of you know conversations and framing of them in, in, as artists, and, and uh, particularly now for here, there was a lot of stuff that came up. Like they always made reference to how he was killed in a bar, and they always made reference to um, like the fact that he wanted to buy a Cadillac, and mm -hmm. you know all these kind of like you know you know regurgitating these racist tropes and. So when my director and I sat down, she's like, listen, we have to find somebody that can tell us. You know. And I was like, well, these people have probably been asked a thousand times to tell their stories or you know, lend their credibility to an exhibition like ours. And when we reached out to Dariva, she was like, no, 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 no nobody asked me. You know, no, like, and, and she was concerned about like us, that we, because she had such a history of people trying to co-opt her story mm -hmm. and turn it into something that it wasn't, and we assured her, and that's the first thing we did, is we assured her that, listen, she was going to get the okay on every move we made in the mm -hmm. exhibition. She was, she was going to own any video footage, anything. And once she understood where her heart was, my God, the information that came out of it was just, you know, even, even as far as, like, dispelling all these uh, rumors about Alfred Harris' character, mm -hmm. you know, he was an incredibly loving, generous, community-based person. And when you read some of the stuff out there, it was completely the opposite. Mm -hmm. You know, he was, you know, especially even the fact that like, like I said, everybody talks about how, you know, his death at the bar. And really that was, the bar was a place where you would go get food, just like, you know, any kind of local sure. tavern or something. And he just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. But they always associated that with mm -hmm. something seedy that was going on, or seedy that was happening. Mm -hmm. And Doritha's video for us was incredibly moving. I mean, when we were here when it was filmed and, you know, we were all, Kind of tearing up because this outpouring of how wonderful this individual was and how they would go to the fields, the tomato fields, and pull people out of the tomato fields and teach them, and teach them to trade, teach them how to sell, teach them how to paint. It was a completely revolutionary experience for us as far as what we had heard in the narrative that was out there and what we experienced. Mm -hmm. So uh, I really appreciate you, uh, you you bringing that up tonight. It was, it was wonderful. Well, thank you. Kind of that topic on economics. Uh -huh. um, Pre-World War II, Florida became one of the major flight construction states. Uh -huh. Almost every community had an airport where they had some training ground. Melbourne, right. Vero, um, West Palm, Opelika. I mean, all these airports, most of them that we see around here today were all World War II built. Right. And and they continue to flourish. Vero had Piper Aircraft moving there. So they had a new economic base of mm -hmm. some industrial type uh, living people made, engineers. Uh, some friends of ours, I know that she used to be on our board, her family came down for vacations every year. And the hotels they stayed at, and these weren't the Hampton Inns and the Holiday Inns, these were the bomb and pop places. And they would have the highway bar on the wall. And they would go to the owners' The little roadside them. motels. Yeah. yeah. And they would buy, they always took back a highway painting yeah. with them after the vacation. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I grew up uh, in South Florida, outside of Fort Lauderdale. And I, you know, I don't know if this is planted memory because, you know, I didn't learn about the highwaymen really until I moved to Orlando and worked at UCF. I never heard of them before. Um, and so now I, I think. Oh, I remember those motels, and I probably saw those paintings, you know, in banks or whatever. Like it just it recalls things, but it's probably like I said, planted, planted memory. What's that? I don't think it's nice to ask the age. Of <laughs> um, I was born. I was born in 1969. Uh, my parents moved to Dania, Florida, when I was five. Well, I'll tell you, I was born in '58 in Fort Lauderdale. Oh, okay. That's why I say I do have a little. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I did have one question that you, it was interesting when you were talking about this economic movement through Florida. Mm -hmm. When we were talking to Rita, it was a time early in when her and uh, Alfred had just got together that they tried to get started in Tallahassee. She was going yeah. to school up there. Mm -hmm. And they talked about Alfred started a studio up there before he moved down to Fort Pierce. And the, the amazing thing to me was they talk, he, she talked about how they couldn't sell any paintings north of Orlando, anything up in Tallahassee. Nobody would talk with them, nobody would buy them. 
And then, in, so Alfred would live in Tallahassee at that point, load up his car with paintings and drive to South Florida, drive to Miami. And they would, they, he would sell them, you know, 20, 20 or 30 in a day. I, I suspect a lot of that, at least in Tallahassee, was related to the fallout from the Tallahassee bus boycott. To the Tallahassee bus boycott, because oh, okay. that would have been around that time, right. and I know because I've been doing some research on um, Florida State University, um, and it, it's clear that the president, Doth Campbell, any any Seminole people, Doth Campbell, the, the, the stadium's okay. named after, right. yeah, <laughs> he was uh, he was president of uh, of FSU during that time, and um, he was really interested in punishing students. And any local entities that were supporting the Tallahassee bus boycott. So I would imagine just by that alone, yeah, there would have been that kind of mentality in the white business community there to be kind of like, you know, hands off, yeah. So that, that makes a lot of sense. And then coming, you know, I know, I know you all heard this cliche, right? The further south you go in Florida, the further north you are, right? And I'm sure that's probably what they were, especially you get to Orlando, right? Because Orlando's, you know, Probably a booming Sunbelt city in you know at least by the 60s, 70s. Well, really right. to the 70s once Disney yeah. came. Sure. Before that modern era, the Space Coast. Yeah. Right. But you know, um, like Bob Carr was sort of like a um, a Sunbelt mayor in a lot of ways. You know, he kind of was. He had a. You know, he was the one that that created the Orlando Civil Rights Commission, and he was really, really interested in projecting that. Kind of um, tolerant image outwardly, and Bob Carr, of course, I believe he's from. I think he's from. Was he from Indi Indiana originally? Like the northern. There were all these northerners who were in the '50s in Orlando, were on city council, mayors, and all sort of kind of stuff. I think. You know, um, there was some probably uh, tolerance of the civil rights movement you wouldn't find in Tallahassee because of it. Well, thank you.